the air with the final countdown in these midterm races. And we are live tonight in a whole bunch of states that might end up determining the balance of power in the Senate for the next couple of years, right? We're going to talk about how those candidates are making their last pitches as both President Biden and former President Trump are out on the trail, too, to try and win votes for their parties. And in some states, you're not just voting on candidates. You're going to be able to vote directly on stuff you want to see in your state. Anything from cannabis, different taxes, health care, abortion access. We're live in Michigan, where the abortion question could swing the whole state. We'll also introduce you to two candidates running to be the very first Gen Z members of the House. What they're telling me about their plans to try to shake up Washington. And here in the Capitol, actually down south in the Capitol, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is back. What we're hearing from her first interview after that horrific attack on her husband. Plus, our doctor's here to explain why some popular diet supplements may not make a difference if you're trying to lower your cholesterol. And if you have big dreams of becoming a big billionaire, you have just a couple hours left to get that lucky Powerball ticket. We'll talk about why the anticipation is so high. Do you have your ticket yet? Stay tuned. Hey, I'm Hallie here from election headquarters in New York. And tonight, with one last day to cast a ballot, the candidates and the big guns, President Biden and former President Trump, are making their last-ditch cases to voters tonight. That their party's vision is what America needs right now. And how they're doing it says a lot about where their confidence level is at the moment. Take the former president. Okay, He's out rallying in Ohio, a state where he ran up big numbers, but there's a tight Senate race. Then you've got the current president in Maryland, where the Democratic governor is expected to win big. This is another sign that the president's party is on defense. You know we love sorting things into buckets on this show, so we've got one, right? A new NBC News poll that gives us a couple of these buckets that show us where this election could go. Start with the economy. More than four in five Americans are not happy right now. And a look back at history shows that's bad for the party of the current president. And the voters our team's hearing from definitely have money on their minds. Listen. Our economy's not doing well. We're almost in a downturn. Got inflation, interest rates. They said that the economy is the most important issue that I would want to see some sort of change. How's cost of living, stuff like that? Uh, you able to get expensive. by? Expensive. Really? Yeah. Expensive. That's what you're hearing from voters everywhere. So if the economy is bucket number one, bucket number two has a couple good signs for Democrats because this is enthusiasm. It looks like they've closed the gap with Republicans over the last month or so. And voters who see abortion access as more important than the economy, they are way more excited, way more enthusiastic to cast a ballot. So what's the catch on that? Well, it's not like those voters are evenly sprinkled out throughout the country. And in swing states, you still have, at least from the polling, Republicans looking like they have an edge. But then here's the third bucket where the numbers kind of can't help us. Why? Because more people vote in midterms now than they ever did before. And because enthusiasm for this election is tying a record. It means that turnout, you know what it all comes down to, could be unprecedented. Can we just real talk for a second? I need you to buckle up for a long week. Because I know we talk about election night. It is going to be election week. Because look at our 2020 projections here. Um, this, is, this is the vote we had in back in 2020. L let's just say it, right? These midterms are probably not going to wrap up tomorrow night. Could be a week. Could be weeks, plural. What do we know? This week, that party is just getting started. And we are getting the party started, too, with our team at the White House and in three states, which could decide the fate of the Senate. Let's kick it off with Dasha Burns, who's in Pennsylvania. It has played such an important role in the midterms, Dasha. We're seeing John Fetterman and Mehmet Oz go big with their closing messaging and new ads today. They both had big weekends with former presidents campaigning with them. But then NBC News polling shows two-thirds of voters have, have already made up their minds, right? They're, they don't think they're going to switch who they're going to vote for on Election Day. Yeah, Hallie, two-thirds made up their minds before Labor Day. That means the last couple of months has really been focused on that one-third left. And you can imagine by now that slice is even smaller. And today, right now, I'm at the Pennsylvania Democrats headquarters here in Pittsburgh, where throughout the day, volunteers have been coming in and out, picking out materials to go out canvassing, go out knocking on doors for that last-ditch, all-out effort to get folks to the ballot box, not just trying to persuade those persuadable voters to vote for their candidate, but really focusing on trying to get voters to vote 
period. And that is going to be critical to get that turnout. I want you to hear from two of the canvassers we spoke with, because I asked them why they decided to spend this Monday doing so. One of them is a woman named Sue. She uh, retired on September 1st. She told me as soon as she retired, she went and came here and said, sign me up. Tell me the work that I need to do. The other you'll hear from is a gentleman named Philip. He's in the Carpenters Union, and he is really passionate about keeping union jobs here in Pennsylvania. Take a listen. There is nothing more important right now than preserving democracy. I think that it's more important in the long run that I come out here and make sure that uh, my pregnant wife and uh, my little two-year-old girl uh, don't, don't grow up in a country that's a fascist state run by people that want to take away their, their reproductive rights. So you hear that for Democrats, we often hear those big picture heart of democracy issues are uh, at the core for them. Of course, you talked earlier, the economy, crime, those kinds of issues also really animating. So it's a question of what wins out here, Hallie. You know, uh, the other thing, Dasha, is the, the numbers here. There is so much money that's gone into this race, the most expensive Senate race in the country, $261 million mm -hmm. that have been spent on ads here. There's also the other number to this, which is obviously going to be turnout, right? Typically, midterm years, fewer people turning out. But Georgia, uh, excuse me, but Pennsylvania is a high profile state at a high profile time. Talk yeah. to me about what you're hearing from folks on the ground. Well, so on that money front, Hallie, just looking at today and yesterday for Democrats, they have been throwing money into the state in the last stretch here. They spent about six million over the last couple of days here. And Republicans, only about 2.6 million. I say only as if that's not a huge number. Point being, everyone is spending a ton of money, but Republic, uh, Democrats have pretty much doubled uh, Republican spending just in this last uh, little bit here. And in terms of that enthusiasm, I don't know. Look, I think a lot of people are exhausted and are ready for this to be mm. over. But at the same time, folks I talk to know that the stakes are really, really high. The thing that people are concerned about now, too, is how long it's going to take to get a final result here, how long people will be waiting and whether or not there are going to be some of those concerns around uh, safety of election workers, safety for folks at the ballot box, um, all of those concerns that have been raised, especially in the wake of the incident with Nancy Pelosi and her husband, the threats of political violence people are worried about here too, Hallie. Dasha Burns, live for us there, MPA. We'll get to more on Speaker Pelosi in just a minute, but I want to go to Ellison Barber, who is down in Atlanta tonight. A lot of attention there. You've got Senator Warnock, who's supposed to be having another rally here in the next little bit. Mr. Walker, Herschel Walker is supposed to have one tonight, too. And there is different messaging coming out of each of these campaigns. I want to play something from Senator Warnock's latest ad, where he is, um, I think, more than we've seen in the early days of the campaign right now, looking at character. Let's watch a bit of it. Herschel Walker hasn't earned my respect or my vote. And, uh, you know, I'm like hundreds of thousands of other Republicans here in Georgia. We're confused. We don't, we don't really have anywhere to go right now. If you held a gun to your wife's head and threatened to blow it off, you're a bad man. Now, Walker's team has said this ad in particular is desperate. They say the senator's wasted millions of dollars here. It's not working. They say he's trying to smear Herschel Walker. Talk to me about what you're hearing from voters, though. It is, are they, is this kind of messaging on, on both sides here, the ads that they're seeing making a difference? You know, it's hard to say in part because this race is so tight. But one thing that stands out to me in that new ad from Warnock, I mean, you're right, at the beginning of this campaign, we really did not see Warnock go there, so to speak, as it relates to questions of character. He really let outside groups do that. He started to sort of go there a couple of weeks ago. But what stands out to me in this ad and seems to be a slight shift in strategy in the final hours, really, of this campaign is who he used in that ad to try and drive home the message that Walker's character is an issue. It's two prominent local Georgia Republicans. I think when you look at some of the recent polling, there is this question of how many potential split voters there are in this race. We saw an AJC poll about a week, a week and a half ago, where it seemed that there were about 10, maybe 11 percent of Republican-leaning voters saying that they are withholding support from Herschel Walker, either splitting their ticket, voting for Warnock, Libertarian candidate, or in some cases saying they're not entirely sure. That was reflected in a Fox News poll as well as the AJC poll. And I think we're seeing Warnock, his campaign in the final days, maybe try to make kind of a last Hail Mary, bigger push directly 
to those voters. I asked uh, Warnock about a week ago about appealing to those Republican leading voters that are unsure about Herschel Walker, what his message was to them. And at the time he said, you know, I think this is a decision between right and wrong, but I think I've been running a campaign throughout this that represents all Georgians. When he was asked a similar question yesterday in Savannah, he gave a very specific answer and went into a lot of details about his relationship with uh, the late Republican Senator Johnny Isaacson, who's very well known, very loved in this state. And I think when you look at that ad and then look at that, it seems like the, that his campaign might think there's some wiggle room with those Republican leaning potential split ticket voters. And it'll be interesting to see yeah. whether or not they're right. But that is kind of a subtle difference that we're seeing. Yeah, you know, we just have to real talk it here, too, because, you know, Dasha referenced this a bit of voter fatigue. I know that's happening in Georgia. I've talked to voters there who feel yeah. that way. But it, it is entirely possible that this race goes to a runoff, Ellis. And I mean, as you're talking about, this is something both campaigns are bracing yeah. for. I know that we will be talking, like I'm convinced, be well beyond Tuesday night. Ellis and Barbara, as you're posted up there waiting for the results in Georgia. I'm afraid so. <laughs> Thanks, friend. Appreciate it. Let's talk about what the president's up to with Carol Lee in Washington. So, Carol, um, you know, we, we've talked about this. The president's in Maryland. Maryland is not a super swingy state, okay? That, it's not a state that's going to decide, like, the balance of power in the Senate, right? Talk to us about the logic right. here and where the White House, sort of what the mood is to folks you're talking to inside the White House with 24 hours now into the first, 26 hours into the first polls start to close. Yeah, sure. If you look at the landscape, Hallie, there are very few bright spots for Democrats, and Maryland is one of them. So that's one piece of this. The White House likes the candidate for governor there, Westmore. It's a, it's a state where they could go from Republican to Democrat. So in a pretty bleak landscape, this is a place where it's a safe space for President Biden. He also is committed to not going to places where he's not wanted. And so this is a place where he is wanted. And so he can go to Maryland tonight, hold this rally. It'll get national media attention. He can make his closing argument. And he's not getting in anybody's way. Now, as far as what the White House thinks in terms of where this is headed tomorrow night, they're basically resigned to having a bad night. At the same time, you know, they're still holding out some hope that they could hold on to the Senate, not so much the House. And we heard from the president, he did two virtual events with DNC, Democratic National Committee fundraisers, where he was trying to put his best face forward, saying he's optimistic and the energy is with the Democrats now. You know, we have NBC has new polling showing that there is new voter enthusiasm among Democrats, but is it really enough? Do you hear the president tell it? He says there's a shot at holding on to the Senate hasn't entirely given up on the House. So that's kind of where they're seeing things. And, and it's now just about turning out the vote and doing that's whatever right. he can to get voters to go to the polls tomorrow. Carol Lee, live for us. We think from Washington, D.C., where daylight savings time has turned it uh, into yep. a black Both hole dark. behind you. Thank you, Carol. Appreciate it. Good <laughs> to see you. From the current president to the former president, Jesse Kirsch is right by Mr. Trump's rally in Ohio. Um, it looks like you're right outside of it, Jess. Talk to us about this, because it shows, um, we're seeing some of the numbers here, that Governor Mike DeWine is running ahead of J.D. Vance in the Senate race, right? So it's interesting here that it seems like there are some people who are at least telling pollsters they're kind of down to split. It, it appears that the strategy is get Donald Trump to come in 24 hours before polls close to boost the base. How productive do the candidates think that's going to be? Yeah, and Hallie, if you want to talk about juicing the base, right now on stage you can hear their boost from the crowd. Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, is speaking uh, in front of the crowd right now. And the congresswoman being here is kind of a full circle moment because she is one of the prominent Republicans who helped push Vance over the finish line in the primary. Former President Donald Trump endorsed, and then you saw the likes of Marjorie Taylor Greene, Representative Matt Gates, as well with her uh, on the trail with Ryan, or sorry, with Vance, excuse me. And we've seen uh, Senator Ted Cruz out here, Senator Josh Hawley uh, in the final days. I asked Vance about this yesterday. What he wants people to take away from the former president being here? He said he wants people to remember what it was like under the Trump president what he called prosperity and he also said above all else this is about getting people out to vote to get people to go to the polls tomorrow here's part of what he told us over the weekend the president's popular in the state of Ohio and deservedly so and he's had, he's he, you know he's, he's endorsed me in the race he endorsed me very early on uh, and so yeah I, I think the president's support certainly helps us in Ohio 
So that's part of what we heard from J.D. Vance, Hallie. Um, and uh, another thing that he continues to tout is inflation, tying that to Democrats, tying that to Congressman Tim Ryan. And he made it as simple as this. How much is a, 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 a container of eggs? How much does it cost you to get a carton of eggs now versus what it cost six months, a year ago? Uh, and I think that's something that got a lot of head nods from people at a crowd we saw him with uh, out in a, a rural area yesterday. That's right. Those are, that's what people are talking about, those kitchen table issues. Okay, so if Republicans are looking to try to turn out the base, right? Look at what Democrat Tim Ryan is trying to do. He is looking, looking to be trying to corral as many persuadable moderate voters as possible. Yeah, yeah, he's also trying to turn out the Republican base just for him. <laughs> a different, uh, he, yeah. he wouldn't be upset if people mistook him. Yeah, he wouldn't be mis uh, upset if people mistook him for a Republican. And we know even from J.D. Vance himself that that has been something that his campaign has had to correct people on because Ryan is trying to keep the party leadership at arm's length. He explicitly told me he did not want President Biden here with him. He brags about uh, trying to stand up to Speaker Pelosi. Vance will, will tell you that all that is a facade and doesn't line up with Ryan's voting record across about two decades of voting. And I even asked Ryan what's something he wants people to hear from former President Trump tonight that he'll agree with him on. And he, he talked about China and trade. Uh, and that's part of what his campaign has been about from the very beginning of this general election. Here's part of what Ryan told us over the weekend about the closing hours. Here. We have Republicans going to Republican headquarters in counties asking for Tim Ryan signs. That's the level of support we're getting across the board. I want them to know I'm the most Ohio guy. I'm not bought and paid for. And that's another thing that this race is really hinged on, is the authenticity debate. Who do people feel is more authentically Ohio? And also, both men trying to paint each other as an extremist. So again, this really is about uh, trying to peel off moderate Republicans uh, for Ryan, whether it be someone who is, is sick of Trump's tactics, his messaging, or, or just doesn't like where the Republican Party is going, irrespective of the former president's involvement. Uh, but no question, this is certainly about uh, trying to get people who are, are diehard Republicans Republicans, diehard Trump fans, uh, out to the polls tomorrow, Hallie. Jesse Kirsch, good to see you on the campaign trail. We'll look for you again, I know, tomorrow if you're on the show. Appreciate it. Speaking of tomorrow, check out this lineup, right? Our special election night coverage starting at 6 o'clock Eastern right here. However you are watching, however you are streaming, tune in 6 o'clock Eastern. Live results and analysis over on the network side. If you prefer to watch it from your traditional TV uh, on that linear side at 8 p.m. We got so much to get to. Uh, our team is ready and ready to rock tell you that much. So listen, let's talk about what's happening back home in Washington, right? Because we are learning that House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, that's where she is tonight, back at the Capitol for the first time since she'd, of course, been with her husband in California after he was attacked in their home at the end of October. Her team is telling us that she'll stay in D.C. through Election Day tomorrow. And it comes as she's sharing more about how she found out about what happened to her husband. In this new interview with CNN, she says she was very scared when there was a knock at her door from Capitol Police. Garrett Hake is at the Capitol. He is joining us now. And Garrett, um, you know, you, your team, I know, tried to talk, catch up with the speaker as she was walking the halls of Congress. We'll be really transparent here. She right now is only talking to CNN, okay? And I, and I think it yep. was super interesting that she said that she was going to, the question was put to her, what about a decision to potentially retire if Democrats lose the House? And she said that this attack on her husband will play into that decision. Um, she, she, she opened up more about this and what it's meant to her. Yeah, that's right, Allie. And look, I've walked down this hallway with the speaker from her office towards the floor dozens of times. I've never had her not chat at least a little bit on the way. I don't think she was just protecting this interview that she did on CNN. No, I think no, it's and that's not my suggestion. Still, I'm sorry. I didn't want to no, imply no, that to no, viewers. No, like, I just mean no. she is, I just want to be honest, like, we didn't get the interview CNN did, and that's okay. We, it's no, still interesting. But when you hear clips from that interview, I think you see why. This is still a challenging thing for yeah. her to talk about. I want to play a little bit of what she discussed with Anderson Cooper about uh, finding out about the attack on her husband and explain why I think it's all relevant on the other side. Totally. I'm thinking my children, my grandchildren. I never thought it would be Paul because, you know, I knew he wouldn't be out and about, shall we say. And so... Um, uh, came in at that time, we didn't even know where he was or what his condition was. We just knew there was a, an assault on him in our home. 
So you hear there the speaker a little shaken up, but later in this interview, she is asked about whether the attack will change or affect the way she's thinking about staying on her job. Remember, she said some time ago that she thought this term as speaker, this Congress, would be the last time she held that role. She told uh, Cooper that it does change the way she's thinking about it, but wouldn't say how. She has shown really no daylight in terms of what she's thinking, whether she'll continue to plan to leave, as she has suggested, if she is running for re-election, whether she'll go after this term. I can tell you Republicans I talk to don't think she will go that she will want to stay want to continue the fight there's some democrats who hope she stays there's quite another group of young up-and-coming democrats who would like to see her go to make room for new leadership um, it is anyone's guess what she will decide because even to the degree she's talking about this effect this tax effect on her decision making she's not letting any light in into what that effect will be it's a, it's a great point garrett um, i'm glad you're there for us thank you you will be posted up there i know tomorrow night uh, as well throughout the election coverage or nearby. Appreciate it. So let's talk about, well, talk about what a lot of people are talking about if they're not talking about the election, and that is Twitter, right? Because you have now today Whoopi Goldberg becoming the latest celeb ditching the app, the platform, after Elon Musk took it over. She announced this on The View today, saying the platform is, in her words, a mess. She said she'd come back if things settle down. Now listen, w like this isn't news because Whoopi Goldberg is famous and she's leaving the platform. It's news because it is emblematic of what is happening to Twitter in the 72 plus hours since Elon Musk has taken it over. Some folks are leaving because they want to. Others say they're getting forced out basically with Musk tweeting today that Twitter's rules will, in his words, evolve over time. But he posted a link to the current policies, including the company's promise to take down accounts that impersonate celebrities or other notable people if you don't very clearly say they are a parody account, okay? There's a lot going on on Twitter. Things are kind of bananas, and it's not just this company. Look at what's happening over at Meta, where thousands of employees could be out of a job, according to the Wall Street Journal. No comment from that company on the possible layoffs. Uh, ben Collins is joining us now live and in person. Friend, good to see you. Thank you. Um, so Musk, yeah. he is like, okay, no, no accounts that impersonate other people, including him, unless yes. they're very clearly labeled a parody. Kathy Griffin is now off the site. Mad Men actor Rich Summer. Others got removed because they were sort of impersonating Musk. Is this a guy with really thin skin, or is there a way that Twitter can really be saying it's they're living up to their policies? Uh, it's both. Okay. Um, I will say that, you know, I, I put out a call for pe somebody who was, in, uh, was banned from impersonating somebody other than Elon Musk. The only person that I heard was somebody's friend, it was a friend of Elon Musk. Everybody else was banned last night for impersonating Elon Musk. Meaning, like, if you were impersonating Oprah Winfrey, you didn't get banned or whatever. Yeah, as far as we know, you, you're still in pretty good shape. There's a guy impersonating Donald Trump right now, so it's just, just one of those things. So On Twitter, impersonating on, Donald Trump yes, and exactly. not kicked off the platform. That's correct. Copy. Um, by the way, what Rich Summers said there, that madman guy, he said, you know, it's not about me. It's not about a celebrity right. doing this. It's just that if, if anyone can have a verified check, anybody can be anybody. You can be an election official. You can be a like a. And to explain, you're saying this because now Musk is saying you can pay money and get a little blue check mark, which that, that's is exactly, like yeah, who cares? But except for the fact that a blue check says you are who you say you are. Ben Collins with a blue check is actually Ben Collins and not some other rando. Right now, but in a couple of days, if you pay eight bucks, you can say you are whatever you want right. if you have eight bucks. So that is the big difference here, and that's that's the danger is you're just delegitimizing pretty much everybody on the website. Can we go back to the who cares factor for a second? Because yeah. a lot of Americans are not on Twitter, Ben, yeah. as you well know, right? However, it is a platform that seems to have some outside influence in various spheres of American culture. Let's talk about what happened on Saturday, right? So. Before Saturday, the Paul Pelosi attack. Uh, everyone, even the guy who attacked Paul Pelosi had the same story. He went in there to go after Nancy Pelosi, couldn't find him, couldn't find her, uh, you know, tied up her husband. Um, and then on Saturday, Elon Musk tweeted something from the Santa Monica Observer, a very much not verified source that uh, once claimed that Hillary Clinton was dead and uh, replaced by a body double. And then suddenly that was the prevailing talking point on the right. And it, what it did, it shifted the Overton window. It made it so, even if you didn't believe that crazy conspiracy theory, maybe you think, like people on Fox News this week, that there's something fishy about this whole thing, even though everybody has the same story. So, so you're these answering things, the who cares question. Yeah, Your point is These like, things, yeah. like, they start on Twitter. Once they get out of a, a large mouthpiece on Twitter, that's when they get to talk radio and eventually your golf course, your church or something. We're putting up a graphic here, um, we're about to, of, of what Musk is promising here to make it an accurate source of information. But he's also saying he wants to loosen up rules. That's what he said all along here. You have to think about what we started off the show with, Ben, right? The reason why I am here in person with you in New York, and that is the election, which is now just, what, 12 hours away as far as polls officially opening for in-person voting the day of. 
What are you hearing from experts, people you're talking to in this realm about their concerns, kind of given the nexus of the who cares piece, undue yeah. influence, and the elections? Well, it's like you're going to, going to play a football game or something tomorrow, and the rules are still sort of up in the air, and nobody knows what's going to happen. Uh, that's what's going on right now. Anything can happen on Twitter tomorrow, anything can happen in these spaces, uh, it's a lot more wide open. There are a lot more obstacles in the field than there were, you know, 72 hours ago. Real quick, what's up with Meta? Why are they laying off so many people? Or uh, reportedly, according yeah. to the journal. The shift to the metaverse isn't happening fast enough for them. Ah. And, um, and that's really all it is. This is a company that, you know, has a, has a standard, very good advertising product, which is Facebook and Instagram. Mm -hmm. They put all their resources behind a thing that's not going to work for another couple of years, and it's not there yet. Ben Collins, good to see you. Thank you. I'm sure we'll be talking again tomorrow. Cool. Appreciate see it. Tomorrow. More than a million people in southeast Florida tonight. Right now, under a hurricane watch, you've got this subtropical storm, Nicole, that's forming off the Bahamas earlier today. Forecasters say this, this, is, a, this is big. Look at it. Here's the radar. You're looking at, listen, all the usual stuff. Coastal flooding, a lot of wind, a lot of rain in the next few days. That includes from the very southern tip of Florida all the way up to the coast of Georgia. Nicole's expected to become a tropical storm in the next day or so. Could even reach hurricane strength. NBC's Bill Cairns is joining us now with more. Bill, you know, I guess technically we are still in hurricane season. Do we typically see storms gaining this much strength this time of year? Uh, rarely. I mean, we have had a Category 3 storm make a landfall in November before in Florida. So it has happened before. But this is kind of late in the season. We were all hoping that Ian was going to be the last one. And now everyone just wants to know, what are we going to have to deal with? Are we going to have cleanup after this? Is it going to be bad? And it's going to be impactful not horrendous that's kind of the bottom line for this storm so where will it be the worst well anywhere to the right of the center of the storm this is not your typical well-defined small storm that's going to have an eye to it or even a large storm this is an immense ocean storm that's going to become more like a tropical system before it makes landfall so we're going to have impacts from all the way up around wilmington back down through the Carolinas, all the way down through Georgia and Florida because it's such a large system. So there's going to be a lot of coastal flooding up and down the East Coast, especially in the Southeast. And then when it makes landfall, we'll get a little bit of wind damage and we'll see where that storm surge is. This is the forecast from the Hurricane Center and they do have it coming somewhere north of Miami, right around Jupiter, maybe West Palm Beach, Category 1 hurricane, and then weakening. So Category 1, you'd expect minor wind damage. Storm surge could be an issue. And then along with it, whatever heavy rain we're going to get. We are under a hurricane watch from just north Miami all the way up to the Space Coast. That includes Melbourne, Indian River, Jupiter, uh, Fort Pierce areas down through West Palm Beach. And as far as the storm surge, remember, with Ian, it was crazy. It was like 12 to 16 feet. This is 3 to 5 feet. So that's still nothing to sneeze at. That's going to erode a ton of beaches at the high tide cycles. We have full moon tonight, so the water's up anyways. So we're going to have problems on the beaches with a lot of beach erosion, hopefully not too much water in homes or anything like that. And also, Hallie, of course, with the rainfall, we'll watch that as the storm moves inland Wednesday night. Thursday. Bill, Karen, stay close to that uh, that map and that big board, your very own version of the <laughs> big know. board. Thank you, sir. If you're planning on getting a new iPhone for yourself or for somebody else over the holidays, hang tight because Apple says there are some problems with production. Just wait. Plus, something fun for you night owls or people who love watching the sky, a blood moon early in the morning. We'll talk about how to watch it coming up in the five things. So listen, by now you've seen all the ads, you've seen all the speeches, you may have a good idea of who you're going to vote for. You may have already voted already. 40 million people have. But there are some other questions at the bottom of the ballot, ballot rather, on ballot measures, proposals, ballot initiatives, right? Stuff on education or taxes or health care in your state or in your jurisdiction that people can vote on directly. Your state probably has them. There's 132 statewide ballot measures this year in 37 states. See this map? Voters are deciding on some big issues that could change the way they live their lives. Watch. Abortion, cannabis, and slavery. Key topics, among others, for some of the ballot measures voters will decide on tomorrow. Start with access to abortion. Now a rallying cry for some voters after the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. In California, Vermont, and Battleground, Michigan, people will decide whether to change their state's constitution to make abortion a legal right. But in Kentucky, the ballot measure asks voters whether they should change their state's constitution to say abortion is not a protected right. Number two, legalizing recreational cannabis. Arkansas, Missouri, Maryland, North Dakota, and South Dakota now asking voters whether they should allow it. If passed, adults 21 and up would be able to buy and possess marijuana, and in some states, they'd be able to grow it, too. And number three, slavery, because slavery as punishment for crime is technically still legal in some states. 
Now, prisoners are not legally considered slaves in the United States, but supporters for some of these ballot measures say they're treated much the same, forced to work for little or no pay. So the question for voters in Vermont, Oregon, Louisiana, Alabama, and Tennessee, whether to change that wording in their state's constitutions or get rid of the punishment exception altogether. Here's the thing on that and a couple of other, a couple of these other ballot measures, experts are saying that, hey, even if they pass, it's not like they're going to have an immediate effect because changes to a state's constitution would also have to involve the state house, the legislature. It is still something super important that we're watching. And one of the places where it's most important is in the state of Michigan. That's where Yamiche Alcindor is. Um, and this, Yamiche, we talked about it, references in this piece. Abortion access is huge there. You've got Prop 3. People are going to be determining whether or not to basically scrap this long-held piece of Michigan's constitution that would restrict voting access. Talk us through it, because Tudor Dixon, the Republican um, it, candidate for governor here, is telling you something kind of interesting about this. Certainly, Holly. I'm here at Michigan State University, where in East Lansing, where Governor Whitmer, who's a Democrat who's running for re-election, she centered the issue of abortion as her closing argument, saying she's going to be protecting women's rights. As you can see, there's a big sign behind here that says vote, and there's all this crowd that's gathering for her. You can also see, if you can see all the way with, with what we're shooting at, her bus just arrived. Her whole team is here, and you have a number of people who are waiting and really hoping to see her and hoping to hear her message tonight. And I should tell you, though, that even though abortion his her closing message. If you look at the latest NBC News poll, which hopefully we can pull up for folks, it shows that jobs in the economy, threats to democracy, and then the cost of living are the top concern for voters. And then abortion comes in at 21 percent. But when you look at this state in particular, abortion is top of mind because, as you said, Proposal 3 will be on the ballot. And there's going to be a number of people voting Michiganders, voting to see, do you want to enshrine abortion rights into the Constitution? The governor says it's critical to do that. Her opponent, Peter Dixon, says it's not. Allie? Um, Yamiche Alcindor, you know, I'm, I'm glad you're there. And it's interesting to hear where people are on both sides of this issue. Um, I've talked with Governor Gretchen Whitmer. You've talked with Governor Gretchen Whitmer. She's the Democratic incumbent. And there's been a lot on the line as far as it relates to abortion access for a long time here. That's certainly true. There's a lot on the line here. As you said, there's that 1931 law that would ban abortion, including if there are cases of rape and incest. And the governor has told me that's just simply not humane. It's simply not what you can do. So you have a lot of supporters, including the people that are here. We can show them the people because, of course, this is the kind of election that you're seeing. You're, this is the kind of scene that you're seeing. People lining up, excited for the governor. Uh, they are saying that there's going to be support in the governor because they're worried about abortion rights. And there are a number of voters who told me that they see this issue as a critical part of this. But again, you have Republicans who are voting for just the opposite. Her opponent, Tudor Dixon, the Republican who's backed by former President Trump, she says she doesn't believe in abortion in any case, including in rape and incest. So when you look at this race, even though the economy is definitely a talking point for both of these candidates, abortion is a critical part of it and it's a critical part of their message. You know what I love about this live shot? You I mean, you're doing it, man. You're out on the campaign trail. It's not like the cleanest feed. It's not the best audio. I hope our viewers are sticking with it because what you're saying is so important and you're in the thick of it. And I just love that so much. So thank you to you and your producer and your crew. We appreciate you deeply. Thanks, friend. Thank you. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, a lawyer for Sandy Hook families saying today that Alex Jones has to pay significant punitive damages to keep him and other conspiracy theorists from keeping up their lies about the 2012 Newtown shooting, calling it, in their words, a hoax. Obviously, it was not. In a hypothetical calculation, the family's lawyers say these damages could total nearly $3 trillion with a T dollars. They have not asked for a specific amount yet. Jones's lawyer obviously says, well, no surprise, they don't think it should be that much, since courts have already ordered Jones to pay nearly a billion dollars to the families. Number two, world leaders, diplomats, campaigners, scientists, all meeting in Egypt for a big UN climate change conference. This is COP27, all about fighting global warming. Some climate activists say really tight restrictions are making it hard for them to protest at this conference. We expect President Biden to be there later on this week. Number three, Apple says it is temporarily cutting back the production of the iPhone 14 because of COVID restrictions at a big assembly plant in China. So Apple's saying, hey, we're going to be shipping fewer phones. You might have longer wait times after ordering right ahead of the holiday season. The factory is run by Foxconn, and it's reportedly been dealing with employees running away from the plant because of its COVID policies and outbreaks. Number two. 
fans celebrating the Astros World Series win with a huge parade in Houston this afternoon. My people in Philadelphia, not so much celebrating, but fine, Houston, take it. The Astros beat the Philly in game six over the weekend. About a million fans turned out in 2017, the last time that Houston won. Number five, if you'll be up all night thinking about midterms tomorrow, along with the rest of us here at 30 Rock, might as well peek outside, take a look at the so-called blood moon. It's a total lunar eclipse. And before the moon disappears behind the Earth's shadow, it's supposedly going to look really red. This is, these are some pictures from the last time this happened. Starts around 3 o'clock Eastern time. NASA says there will be, a, like, not another one of these until 2025. So, um, you know, set your alarms or just stay up late. I, I'll be asleep. But I'll see you on the Today Show bright and early right after it. When we come back, a new study is out looking at what actually helps cut cholesterol. And some things you might be taking may not be helping. Stay with us. If you are taking fish oil pills to fix your quote unquote bad cholesterol, I'm really sorry to tell you, probably not doing much. Don't shoot the messenger. This is according to a study from Cleveland Clinic that found that different groups like had their bad cholesterol change and they took one of three things, either a dietary supplement, a low dose of a statin designed specifically to lower cholesterol or a placebo. The supplements they included were fish oil, cinnamon, garlic, turmeric, plant sterols, which are supplements that have natural compounds from plants or red yeast rice. Do you know what worked? It was the statin. Okay, that had the biggest impact that really lowered the bad cholesterol compared to supplements. Dr. Torres joins us now. Um, is there any harm in using the supplements, right? Like, there's a lot of stuff that people take, I take, yeah. and I don't really know if science backs it up, but it mentally it makes me feel better. And Hallie, the, the issue is there could be some harm in it because some of these, if you take them, they could interfere with your medication. Other ones, if you take them, they could actually cause health problems. And the study found out that some of these actually increased some of the cholesterols you wanted to decrease and decreased some of the cholesterols you wanted to increase. The other problem is the contaminants in the supplements, that since the FDA doesn't regulate them, there could be contaminants, and they have found out time and time again that that does happen. So, yes, there could be some issues with this, and that's why this is such an important study. Well, that is helpful to know. Can you explain, though, a discrepancy that I think people might be thinking about? Because there was a study earlier this year, and I think people know this. This was in the Journal of the American Heart Association. Even if they don't know the study, they know the benefit of taking stuff like omega-3 supplements, right? And this study found that that helps with things like lowering blood pressure, et cetera. How do you do that, right? Like, what's the way that people need to get at that if they want to lower their blood pressure but also keep their cholesterol at a good place? Like, how do people sort through this? And can that's you, a can great you tell question. I'm not a doctor? The I don't know, Dr. Like John. This is why I have you on to <laughs> answer this stuff. <laughs> No, and one of, the, one of the things the study found out, which I think is important, is that statin worked really well at lowering cholesterol, particularly lowering LDL, which is that bad cholesterol, which is the important thing you want to get under control. But on the other hand, we do know that omega-3 acids in some forms can actually help with heart health, and it actually decreased you dying from heart problems overall. But that was if it was taken in its natural form, meaning eating fish that contained omega-3 three to four times a week. The supplements themselves, they've been shown to help somewhat with, with rheumatoid arthritis, but as far as the actual keeping cholesterol under control, preventing heart attacks, the jury's still out on that. It doesn't look like that's working very well. The natural supplements, though, seem to be helping out, though, Hallie. Dr. John Torres, I appreciate your breakdown. You wise doctor, you. Thank you. You bet. Coming up, we'll take you to the ground in Nevada where there's a lot of Democratic incumbents in tight races. One in particular who is considered among the country's most vulnerable. Plus, Folks in California are looking into whether a meteorite is responsible for what you see on your screen, the destruction of this guy's house. Wow. We'll talk about that in a minute. So the midterms may not only be a shift in party power, but it could be the start of a new era on Capitol Hill, the start of a Gen Z era. OK, because this year marks the first year that any Gen Zer is eligible, right, meets the minimum age to serve in Congress. Two of them, by our count, two have made it to the general election. I hit the road to talk with both of them as we take a look at how this generation of candidates could shape the next generation of politics. 25 years ago, flying. Titanic debuted in theaters. You've got mail. AOL launched Instant Messenger. <laughs> And the very first members of Gen Z were born in 1997. Now, for the first time, finally eligible to serve in Congress. Well, like Maxwell Frost, whose 25th birthday was in January. He's the front runner to win his district in Central Florida and head to the House of Representatives, where the average age of his potential congressional colleagues is 58. 
Did you ever come across anybody who said, hey, wait your turn, you're too young, you don't yeah. have enough experience? 100%, yeah, many people who said that. During his campaign, Frost took midnight shifts as an Uber driver to help pay rent after leaving his job working for the March for Our Lives campaign. Created after the 2018 school shooting in Parkland, Florida. The Pulse nightclub attack in 2016. Oh, yeah. I've been here at like 1 a.m. just to kind of ground myself. Come and touch base. And yeah. Almost in his own so, backyard. You know, gun violence has been my leading charge in my life um, ever since Sandy Hook um, and just it hitting home. It was a lot uh, for, for everyone in our community. So. I imagine this was part of that big impetus for you to decide to make this run to Congress. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely part of it. Gun reform ranks as one of the top issues for Gen Z voters below climate change, threats to democracy, abortion access, and the economy. It's a generation more liberal than any other, with exceptions, of course. Caroline Levitt is a 25-year-old former Trump White House staffer running in her home state of New Hampshire. I live amongst Generation C. They are my friends. They are my former colleagues. And the truth is they are believing in, in liberal ideologies that have sent this country into the crises we're facing right now. She was attacked during her Republican primary for her age. Woke, immature, and irresponsible. Frankly, I just laughed at those attacks. If Levitt wins next week, she'd be the youngest member of Congress, the youngest woman, and the youngest election-denying Republican in office, even though there's no evidence of widespread fraud in 2020. Will you accept the results of your own election? Of course, yeah, absolutely. Even if you lose, you'd accept those results? Yeah, I would accept the results because I think, uh, you know, we have to move forward. We Younger people historically have not turned out to vote in big numbers, but this year could be different, with a new poll showing more than a third of Gen Zers saying they'll definitely cast a ballot. I don't know if we're going to see a red wave. I'm not sure if we're going to see a blue wave. What I do know is we're going to see a Gen Z wave. What's interesting, so Gen Z wave, right? Voter turnout, if those numbers hold... You could see turnout meet or even break the record set in the 2018 midterms for the youth vote. It was a youth vote midterm record. Um, and so we're going to find that out this week, right? Is Gen Z going to turn out? You tell me. We'll find out if they turn out in Nevada, okay, where the Senate race is in a virtual dead heat. you got the Republican, Adam Laxalt, trying to unseat Democratic Senator Catherine Cortez Masto. She's considered among the most vulnerable Senate Democrats, if not the most vulnerable some big guns have come in to try to help her out. Former Presidents Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. You had today Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg all rallying for her leading up to Election Day. Cortez Masto is the first Latina to be elected to the Senate. And Latino voters, many people think, could be key to her re-election hopes. Here's NBC's Guad Venegas with more. It is a very tight race between Republicans and Democrats here in Nevada, especially with that U.S. Senate race between incumbent Democrat Catherine Cortez Masto and her challenger, Adam Laxalt. Now, there's two groups of voters in the state of Nevada that we've been paying a lot of attention to. One is, of course, the nonpartisans. Uh, here in Washoe County, about a third of registered voters are nonpartisans. And then, of course, there's the Latino vote. In the whole state of Nevada, it is projected that one in five voters these midterms will be Latino. Now, when it comes to the nonpartisans, these voters have been speaking to us for months. And in the days leading up to the elections, they have told us they want to see somebody win who can work with the opposing party, somebody who can focus on the importance of bipartisanship. But they also tell us they are upset at the same issues that Republicans and Democrats are upset about. The economy, inflation, the price of gas, housing. I mean, it's very expensive to live in Nevada. And of course, a lot of them tell us they are also worried about abortion rights. It's going to come down to these candidates, whether Kathy Cortez Master or Adam Laxalt, it's going to come down to them swaying some of those nonpartisan votes and then, of course, getting some of that Latino vote. Kathy Cortez Masto uh, is the first Latina to be elected to the U.S. Senate for the state of Nevada. She is counting on that Latino vote. We have been speaking to Latino voters both in Clark County, where Las Vegas is located, and here in Washoe. A lot of the voters telling us that they don't feel like either candidate 
created it um, has represented them the way they want to be represented. But the majority of the Latino voters that we have spoken to have said they plan to support the Democrats. Now, something that we have to keep in mind is that when it comes to the Latino voters, usually those that have been supporting the Republican candidates, both in this election and the past presidential election, those Latinos are not as vocal. They try to keep quiet. So it's difficult to know how Latinos will be voting in this election, but definitely important for all the candidates, for both Republicans and Democrats, to win that Latino vote and the nonpartisans here in Nevada. Back to you. From our Northeast Bureau, the Boston Bruins are pulling a contract for Mitchell Miller after the team's president acknowledged they dropped the ball in vetting him. Miller is currently banned from the NHL after teams found out in 2020 he was convicted as a 14-year-old for assaulting and bullying a black classmate with developmental disabilities. Several Bruins players have said they opposed the signing to team leadership. Bruins president Cam Neely admitted they didn't speak with the victim's family before the decision. He says he's apologized to the victim and his mother. In an earlier statement, Miller said what he did was wrong and unacceptable. We've also reached out to his agent for comment on his offer being rescinded. From our West Coast Bureau, a man in Northern California says something hit his home and set it on fire and horrifically killed one of his pets. Investigators are now trying to figure out, was it a meteorite that did this? Look at this. People there say they saw this like, bright light, big bright light in the sky. Look at that. That's on your screen. They followed it. They wanted to see where it was going to land, and it led them to this house that was all burnt up. Officials are still trying to figure out the exact cause of the fire, obviously. From our Southeast Bureau, it may not be the dog ate my homework, but it's pretty close. A bunch of finished SAT tests flying out of a UPS truck. So now dozens of students at a high school in Texas may have to retake the SATs. Talk about a bummer. It's not clear how the tests actually fell out of the truck, but UPS has apologized. They say they're trying to, like, recover as many missing exams as possible. But if it looks like that, you are out of luck, friends. I feel bad for those kids still to come. That enormous Powerball jackpot is still up for grabs for now. Nearly $2 billion. It's got folks all over the country dreaming big. Even though the odds are against them, we're going to get into the numbers. Not to bum you out, but just to give you a reality check next. Lay it on me. Did you get your Powerball ticket? Did you? $1.9 billion, biggest lottery jackpot ever, because nobody had all the matching numbers for the drawing on Saturday night. That has been happening for months, nobody hitting all the numbers. It's taken this long to get a winner because the odds of winning are not great. One in 292 million. Oof. Still a ton of money up for grabs here. Some perspective, it's more than the top 20 highest paid athletes made combined, according to Forbes. A lot of people are going to be watching the draw tonight with the head of the Powerball product group saying, I think we're all eager to find out when this historic jackpot will eventually be won. Emily Aketa joins us now. Um, some people this weekend got five numbers but didn't get the sixth, so they only got a million dollars. Smallest violin for them. The jackpot keeps getting bigger, and here we are with history being made. Yeah, only a million dollars. But you bring up an important point. Even if your ticket, I've got mine here, doesn't match all six Wait numbers. Wait a second. No, no, real is that actually a real ticket? Of Did you really buy that ticket? Oh, oh, yes, I just went in here and I grabbed it. Absolutely. Like your personal Emily Aketa ticket. All this right, is girl. my personal Emily right. Ikeda ticket. And fun fact, Hallie, this is actually the first time I've played the lottery this weekend. First time I've ever played the lottery. Did so you I, only buy I one? I have some beginner's luck here, right? Well, it's three. This one has three. Okay. All right. Don't show enough? those numbers. You better keep those off camera, <laughs> girlfriend. I'm just I know. giving you some friendly well, see, advice. I, I did strategically put, <laughs> only show the back, only show the okay, backside right sweet. now. But what, what I will tell you is everyone is waiting to see if finally people, someone will win the ultimate grand prize because this is actually the longest running streak for someone not to claim that prize. Although, as you pointed out, we have seen people claim smaller prizes, a million dollars, for instance, here in New Jersey to one resident. So it's still a good deal there. What if nobody wins? Like tonight. It just keeps growing. It keeps getting it keeps getting bigger and bigger. There's really no telling where this is going to go. And I think that excitement, that massive jackpot on the line, that is all by design, experts say. A number of years ago, lottery uh, organizers had increased number combinations to, one, worsen your odds, but also allow the jackpot to grow. Because, as I mentioned, when no one wins, the jackpot rolls over, the prize gets bigger, people get more excited. To give you an idea of what level of excitement we're seeing here in New Jersey, for instance, 
fans typically on a daily basis. They see about a half a million dollars in Powerball ticket sales. Yeah. Well, now buyers are getting tickets six times, 16 times here. that rate. People just incredibly excited about nearly $2 billion on the line. Who's not excited about it? I see Tom Yamas over in the corner. He's getting ready for his show, Emily. Um, Tom, come on over really quickly. Did you buy a Powerball ticket? We're going to get a quick newsroom poll here. Um, did you get power? I got five tickets, I'm told. My partner got five tickets. What'd you get? I, I don't have a microphone. How are you doing? That's okay. Good? Did you get your Powerball? I did. I won $12. Oh, Tom won $12, Emily. I don't know if she's even still with us. She probably... Well, I'm sorry to say, this is the winning ticket, so... <laughs> Emily's, Emily Aketa has the winning ticket. She hates to break it to us. Oh, we're really on the air? <laughs> thank you. I'll you see you in a little joking. bit. Emily Aketa, appreciate you. Uh, thank you very much. I know she'll be keeping an eye on all Powerball things moving forward. Um, that is a wrap for this hour. We have a lot to get to in the next 24 hours, gang, okay? Not just our show tomorrow, same time, same, same place. But special election coverage. It starts at 6 o'clock Eastern. How are you streaming? How are you watching? Do that tomorrow night, right? At exactly this time, you're going to see me and Tom again right here on NBC News Now. And then the rest of the team at 8 p.m. over on the network. More coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.